So I'm Carrie McGreal, and I'll talk about me in just a minute. But I'm here to talk about how to live your best life on dialysis. Um, here is the active, or the disclaimer from the PKD Foundation. Our disclosures, and personally, I have no financial or conflicts of interest to disclose. So I'm Carrie McGreal. I'm a nephrologist, uh, PKD expert at the University of Kansas. Um, I see both PKD patients and chronic kidney disease patients, take care of them pre and on dialysis and work them towards transplant. Um, I do a lot of research as well in polycystic kidney disease translational and clinical trials. But I, today, I'm here to talk about the dreaded D word. And everybody freaks out when they hear about having dialysis or to have this conversation. This is usually what people picture about dialysis. It's terrible, our life sucks, I don't wanna do it ever. And hopefully after going through different types of dialysis today, we'll get more of approach of it, it you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's spa-like, but it's not the, you know, the end of the world and we can make it fit into your life and have a good life on dialysis if you show to choose. So today I'll talk about the basics of dialysis, the types of dialysis, complications, long-term complications from dialysis, and a way, a way to, I think, maintain a healthy life on dialysis. So let's just all acknowledge that starting dialysis is overwhelming and scary. I'm gonna tell you right now, and I can't sugarcoat it, it is life-changing. You now rely on a machine to do the job of your kidneys, but it's not life-ending. Um, and I think overall, there's a way to make dialysis fit into your life instead of make your life fit around dialysis. And I think going into it with that mindset can be helpful as well. So there are three different types of treatment for overall kidney failure. And today we're gonna to focus on dialysis where a machine does the job of the kidney. The job of the kidney is to clean the blood and to remove fluid. Um, and the machine does both of that. And I'll talk about ways to do it. The other way to treat kidney failure is get a transplant. Get a new kidney that can do the job your ones aren't doing. Um, which is ultimately, I think, a goal for a lot of our patients to get there. You can also do conservative management where we just manage symptoms for as long as possible and they elect neither dialysis nor transplant. Um, but I think for today, it's, we really are dialysis and maybe even dialysis as a bridge to, to transplant if that's what you choose. Um, so there are two types of ways to do dialysis. We can do hemodialysis is where the blood's taken out of your body, goes through a machine and gets put back in. You can do that both at home or in center. There's peritoneal dialysis is what you do at home. And so as I talk through these different types of dialysis, you need to think about what your priorities are. And I'll tell you right now, there's no one best solution for everybody. It comes down to you and what your priorities are. So as I talk about this, I want you to think about, is dialysis a bridge to transplant? Do I have a lenny donor and I'm gonna do it for two or three months? Or I'm getting listed, I'm gonna do this for two or three years. Do you travel a lot? Do you know, do you have, set work hours and, and things like that you need to work around. Do you have a ton of kids at home and getting you know, to a center is not gonna work well? Or you, don't, you know, don't have a lot of space or you live alone and you wanna socialize in the dialysis unit. So I think there's a lot of things that go into choosing your type of dialysis. Um, and, and I think it's a very personal um, individualized decision. So hemodialysis where the machine uh, cleans the blood, the machine filters the blood, the blood's pumped through the body, through a filter where waste and fluids are removed and it gets put back in. So, and this is probably what most dialysis patients think of what the machine looks like. Um, it actually, so this is a, you know, a, what a dialysis, in-center dialysis machine looks like. Um, you have you know, your blood leaving the body, it gets pumped through here, through this dialysis filter here. Um, and your dialysis is getting pumped through here, removing toxins and waste and it gets removed and your blood gets put back to you, okay? Um, so this is just another way to look. The, the dialyzer or the, the filter, as we call it, um, it's full of hollow fibers with millions of tiny little holes that allow the toxins to get removed and fluid to get removed through those holes, through something we call diffusion, a little convection. Um, the circuit itself holds out a cup of blood, if that's um, of interest to you. And when we do hemodialysis, we have to have something called an access so that we can get the blood out of the body and back in. So there are, there are three main types of access I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Um, a central venous catheter access, um, which they place this big, big IV, usually in your chest here, and it's a tube that goes right to your heart and allows us to pull the blood out fast enough to clean and put back in. We can't do it fast enough with a, a peripheral IV, we have to have a big IV. The pros of this is I can use it as soon as I put it in the same day. The cons are it's a higher risk of infection and it causes clot. Um, and we don't recommend this for long-term dialysis use. 
Patients with a catheter on dialysis are 50% chance higher death rate compared to those who have a fistula. So this is why we don't recommend this long-term. You're more likely to die if you do long-term dialysis with a catheter compared to a fistula. So what is a fistula, arterial venous fistula? Essentially, they take an artery and a vein and they sew it together. Um, it's usually in the arm, um, do lower or upper. It's our preferred type of access. Um, it requires a surgical placement, um, but there are new techniques doing percutaneous fistula placements where you don't have to do a, a same day surgery as well. And as I said before, people with fistulas live longer and do better on dialysis than people with catheters. And they could take about three months for us to use. So you'll see it here, the blue is the vein. They have sewn it to this artery right here, and that allows the blood to come through the artery and into the vein, and that vein gets nice and strong. And that allows us to stick the fistula for dialysis, as you can see with these needles here. So it does get stuck every time you do dialysis. Um, if your veins are not strong enough or big enough to think that we can get a nice big vein for a fistula, we can do what's called a graft. Um, and it's where we put a piece of tubing that connects the vein and the artery, as you can see here. Um, and that allows us to stick the tubing because your vein won't get strong enough to be able to handle it. It's the, probably our second favorite type of access to use compared to favorite over catheter. The downside is you do have a foreign body, plastic, so it's more likely to get infected, um, and it's more likely to clot than a fistula. And this does require a surgical placement. It may take about three to six weeks to get ready to use. There are urgent access or same-day access use grafts out there as well that you can probably use the same day, um, but they're not as frequently used as the other types. So my advice for people with CKD4, chronic kidney disease 4, is for access placement, if hemo is what you want to do, is that you protect your non-dominant arm. And that means you don't let people take blood pressures, IV sticks, IV starts, or blood draws on that arm, because you're saving that arm to get a fissure. You want to keep that vein nice and not let it get overused by blood draws so that we can get a, an access placed. And I usually tell people you can start probably around chronic kidney disease days 4, really protecting that access arm, OK? So how does hemodialysis feel? Well, initially, when I start people on dialysis, they feel much better, because I've cleaned the blood. You no longer have all those kidney toxins that have been hanging around for months. Um, and again, the treatments themselves, just the cleaning of the blood is relatively painless. The, the, most of the time, I, I see patients with a lot of symptoms. That's cramping, fatigue, nausea, and stuff. It's coming when we have to take off a lot of fluid. So that fluid shift and that aggressive fluid removal seems to lead to more symptoms on dialysis or that afternoon um, as well. But this is also very individualized. Everybody feels different on dialysis as well. So you can do, like I said, you can do this in center. So what does in center hemodialysis look like? It is done three times a week, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Three and a half to four and a half hours, depending on how much blood cleaning and how much fluid removal you need. You can do this, that, or you can do it at night three times a week, called nocturnal hemodialysis, where you go usually around nine and leave the center at four, and you can do this three times a week. The pros to doing in center is you're not doing it. Someone else is sticking you, someone else is doing the treatment, someone else is managing it. You just get to sit there, hang out. And some people like the socialization. They live alone. They come and talk to the people sitting in the center. The cons are you're stuck to your time. Your time is 10 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm there for three and a half to four hours. And it's very rigid in that component. Um, and you usually have a stricter fluid limit and dietary restrictions because you're not getting as frequent dialysis as the people who do home. Um, so that limits some of that stuff. So what does an in-center dialysis unit look like? You just have usually chairs around the room next to treatment machines, nurses in the middle. And as you can see, like you're, you're sitting around people, so some people like that. Uh, but that's what an in-center dialysis looks like. And this is the, probably the most common, well, it's not it's probably, it is the most common form of dialysis in the United States. So home dialysis. Now, you can do this at home. Now, you can do nocturnal or you can do short daily treatments. Um, and these are usually two hours of treatments, five to seven days a week. You get to pick the days. You get to pick the times. We just don't like you to miss more than two days in a row. Um, and it's less... Um, it's supposed to be a less restrictive diet. Sorry, not less restrictive diet. So you have, because you're doing dialysis five to seven days a week, you can have a little bit more liberalization in your fluid and your diet because you're removing these things faster or daily. You can travel with them. So you can travel with the machine, and the company ships the supplies to your destination. Um, got some patients that go to the lake. So everything gets shipped to their lake house for their period in the summer, and they can do it down there um, without really much hassle for them other than taking the machine. The cons are you need space to put the machine in the supplies, 
you do have to stick yourself with the needles, and they train you how to do that, and, if, and then set up the machines. Um, so this is what a, a next stage home hemo machine looks like. It's about a 17 inch cube. It does weigh about 70 pounds, so it is a little hefty, um, but you don't require special wiring or plumbing or anything to run it, it just plugs in, and the box below it is what holds your dialysate to clean the blood. So, peritoneal dialysis. This is what we call the bloodless dialysis. It's where you use your body as a blood cleaning filter or the peritoneal membrane. So the peritoneal membrane is a lining in the abdominal cavity. It's like a sac that holds all your organs in. Um, and we put fluid, dialysate in, and it allows waste to come from the blood into the dialysate, and then we take the fluid off, and that's how we remove fluid and toxins. So what does this look like? So you have dialysate that can go into this peritoneal cavity, and then it'll sit there for a period of time, waste, and it'll drain out. Um, and to do this, we have to have a peritoneal dialysis catheter. So what's the catheter? The catheter is this long plastic tube. It usually sits here on the bottom of the peritoneal cavity in your lower pelvis. Um, you attach it to what we call a transfer set that has a clamp, and then this connects to the machine. So on a person, what does this look like? So you usually have the catheter here sticking out of your belly. And a lot of times, patients have these belts or things to tie up this extra tubing so it's not always flopping around. They can do parasternal. That, uh, that are peritoneal catheters where you tunnel it under the skin and it comes out here in the chest. A couple reasons to do this is if you have a lot of abdominal obesity, this allows a catheter in an easier sight to see and clean. Or if I've had a couple people who are bath people and they want to take a bath, but if we can, this allows them to do that as long as they can keep this out of the bath, okay? So there's two ways to do peritoneal dialysis at home. You have continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. And what this is requires no machine. You put the fluid in three to five times a day. It sits, the, the exchange to go in takes about 30 minutes. Um, and it sits there for a couple hours and then you drain it out and put more fluid in. And you just do this continuous all day, every day. Um, and the exchanges are done manually. Like I said, no machine. Um, the downside is you have to have a place where you can do this sterilely, where you can connect the bag and all using sterile technique from that standpoint. Um, so again, we, we saw this before, dialysate goes in, you have the catheter, it runs in by gravity, and then you drain it out in the empty bag by gravity. And this is what it would look like with a real person. You have your dialysis catheter, or your dialysate fluid bag here running in, having it up on the pole so it can run in. You just have to have a space to do this sterilely. But that means you have about a liter to a fluid in during the day continuously. The other option is probably the most used option here is what's called continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis, also known as automated peritoneal dialysis. You have a machine, if you hear it talked about, called a cycler. And you hook yourself up at night, which is about eight to 10 hours. Fluid goes, the machine pumps the fluid in for a couple hours and then pumps it out again. And you just do this all night while you sleep. The amount of time you're on the cycler and the amount of time your dwell is will depend on how much dialysis you need in your membrane. So that's not always a guarantee. Now this allows you to, for some people to have daytime no fluid in your belly or not have to do an exchange. You just have fluid in during the day and you hook yourself up and it drains it at night um, to take away those daytime exchanges that CAPD has. So that looks like you have your pump here and it usually has a heater on it so the fluid going in is warm and not cold. Um, you have extra supplies of bags and it just pumps it in while you sleep. And the machine looks like this in person. It weighs about 25 pounds. So it's right here on a nightstand. Um, you travel with it, again, and the bags and fluids can be shipped to wherever you go. Um, the downside is, when doing PD, is you get a bump supply of bags. So this is about how many bags you get you have to store in your house at some place. So it takes up space, okay? Um, and there are certain things that make you probably not a candidate for PD right away. So one is uncorrected abdominal wall hernias. If you have a hernia and I put fluid in and put pressure on that cavity, that hernia is only gonna get worse and worse. So we have to correct a hernia before we can put you on peritoneal dialysis. If you've had a lot of abdominal surgeries and you have a lot of scarring or adhesions as they call in your belly, the membrane's not gonna work as a dialysate filter because it's all scarred up, so we can't do it. If you have what's called a pleural peritoneal shunt, meaning you have a hole in your abdominal diaphragm that sends fluid up into your lung space, I can't put fluid in your belly because it's gonna go into your lungs and that causes problems. Um, if you don't have the space or a, like a clean environment at home, um, that allows you to be sterile to do these techniques so you don't get an infection. So there are barriers to PD. Barriers is probably not the, quite the right word to use, but that's what 
the internet and all the papers use. It's just things that we have to think about and maybe adjust or overcome. So as I talked about obesity, you have to have a clean site that you can see on your belly to do this. And if there's not one, we can do a pre-sternal catheter to help with that. Same thing with an ostomy bag. If you have a colostomy or an ileostomy or a suprapubic catheter, we don't want these two um, exit sites in your belly next to each other. So we either have to go on the other side or, again, do parasternal. That doesn't mean we can't do it. We just have to think of ways around it. Now, they list PKD, and I thought this was a little odd because do, we do a lot of PD on PKD patients, but it kind of makes a little sense. If you have extremely large kidneys that are already taking up a ton of space in your belly, and I want to put another two liters of fluid in there, that can get uncomfortable. So one of the things we have to do is just a lot more lower volume exchanges, um, but we do have a lot of patients who do peritoneal dialysis with PKD very successfully. Um, so pets. You, you can have pets, but you cannot have them in the room when you're doing the exchanges because you need a sterile environment. Um, so I've had patients switch to home hemo because they their pets sleep in their room, and that is fine. You have a room, no pets in it, do your home hemo. That's totally fine and things to think about as well when you go through this. Um, or malnutrition. So th when you do PD, you lose protein in that fluid that you take off at night or in the, from it we remove. And so we have to make sure you stay well nourished. And so eating a lot of protein, and if you're already malnourished, I don't want to make you worse and more malnourished by doing PD either. So some pros for peritoneal dialysis. Again, you have fewer restrictions on food and diet and fluid because you're doing it every night. You're in charge of your treatments. You can hook up at 7 one night. You can hook up at 9 one night as long as you do the time. Travel is easier. You can do it a lot of places. Some data says it may be gentler on the heart because you're removing fluid all night, every night, instead of the three hours, but that hasn't, we haven't seen that yet in really bigger studies. Cons is you're doing it every day. PD is done every day, and you don't get a break. You carry about two liters in your abdomen during the day. Um, if you're a diabetic, the way we pull fluid off is with sugar, so in the dialysate. So diabetic control initially is a little rocky at start to make sure we get your blood sugar staying well controlled. Um, it just takes some adjusting to your regimen. As long as you're aware of that and understand what's going on, it, it makes things easier. But we do that all the time in, in diabetic patients. You need to take extra protein because, again, you lose protein in the, from the fluid. Um, you have to have space to store all those bags for the whole month of your PD. And again, swimming, lakes, keeping that site clean and dry is restrictive in that as well. Um, so peritoneal versus in-center, everybody always asks me, I want to do whatever is best for me. Like, which one's going to make me live longer? Neither one really does make you live any longer. People tend to anecdotally feel better when they do home dialysis, um, on home dialysis and PD, either one. Um, and again, what we do know is your peritoneal dialysis allows you to keep your kidney, what we call residual renal function, longer. So that means you continue to make urine, you continue to pee, you have a little bit of kidney function that can help you out with fluid and diet restriction because they're doing some of the job. So that sometimes helps people feel better, too, is you have that residual left a little bit. Um, so going back to how you choose, it comes down to your choice and priorities. Um, there is no right answer at what works for you. What I also want to point out is you can start with one and switch if you find out it doesn't work for you. You're not stuck to whatever dialysis you pick. Um, you know, I've had a lot of patients start in the center, and then they start to get used to being stuck. Then they stick their self in the center, and then they can talk about going home. They feel comfortable with it. Um, or they get on peritoneal and they can't handle the, the blood sugar and the fluids and stuff, so we switch to hemo. So it just all depends on what works with your life um, and how that fits. So I spent a little bit of time talking about complications of dialysis. A lot of this is long-term complications. And I talk about this because I think knowing the complications helps you leave a healthy life on dialysis to try to prevent them. And you'll notice some themes as I talk about this, especially with the long-term. But at first, there's acute complications. The main two that we struggle with is going to be infection, both with peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Um, peritoneal, you get infection in the belly of peritonitis. That's why you need that sterile environment to make sure we're not contaminating that. Um, hemodialysis is bacteremia, which is blood in the bacteria in the bloodstream. Again, you're sticking into your bloodstream. Blood's leaving the body, so it's always a risk. Um, these are low risk, but they are risks and things to, can happen. The other issue we struggle with is something I lump in is access issues. So your fistula doesn't work, or it's clotted, or it needs an intervention. Your graft can clot. Um, your catheter doesn't work and you need to exchange. Your PD catheter doesn't drain well. We have to move it. We have to reposition it. So there's always things with the 
call it the plumbing system, but like that doesn't work, so we have to adjust or fix it because it's just not functioning. So these are some of the things that you can run into on a daily basis acutely with dialysis. The long-term complications of a dialysis I want to touch on is going to be heart disease, bone disease, anemia, something called amyloidosis, and then nerve damage. And the reason I kind of walk through these long-term complications is it helps you live a healthy life if you know how to try to prevent some of these. So heart disease is the number one cause of death in dialysis patients. Um, there are two types, main types of heart disease we talk about. Heart failure, which means your heart doesn't pump like it should, so the blood's not circulating as well as it should. Or coronary artery disease. And what this means is the blood vessels going to the, give the heart oxygen become stiff, narrow, or clogged, and your heart doesn't get good blood flow. So then it becomes ischemic and doesn't work well. Um, and so why do these things happen? High blood pressure, anemia, poor balance of calcium, phosphorus. And a lot of our patients, I'm like, you guys, for PKD, that's not usually a, a problem with diabetes, okay? That also adds to the cardiac vascular burden. Um, so how do you keep your heart healthy on dialysis? Everything that's typical of a heart-healthy diet. Control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, physical activity, keeping your calcium and phosphorus in balance. And I'll talk a little bit more on that in just a second. Stop smoking, control your blood sugars, and, you know, lose weight. So typical healthy things will help you do better from a heart disease standpoint. One thing I want to touch on about heart disease and dialysis is volume or volume overload. So one of the things that hemodialysis does is remove fluid. So everything, if you don't make any urine, everything you take in, I have to remove with the machine or the machine has to remove to keep you not from getting volume overload. So extra volume on board leads to high blood pressure, which also worsens the heart. It can lead to damage of the heart, and we'll talk about it develops something called left ventricular hypertrophy. Because you have extra fluid in your system, the muscle in your heart has to build up to pump more fluid and it becomes stronger. Well, that just takes over space and then you can't really have room to pump this. And so I'll show you what this looks like. So this is a normal, healthy heart with your left ventricle here, right, right atrium, left ventricle. And this is the one that the left ventricle pumps the blood to the body. So if you have a lot of extra fluid buildup, this muscle becomes really strong to pump all that extra fluid and pressure. Well, then your space to get, fill blood in gets real small. So you can't pump as much blood out to the body. And so volume overload leads to this left ventricular hypertrophy, which leads to cardiac disease and, and that. So to prevent this, um, low fluid gains between dialysis, so keeping that volume under control, blood pressure, which helps, low salt, because salt helps you regain fluid, control your blood sugars if you're diabetic, because high blood sugars do make you thirsty. Um, you quit smoking. One of the things we talk about is medications. So even if you develop left ventricular hypertrophy, it can get better if you take the steps to improve your heart health. So there's two types of medications that really um, have been used is angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocking agents or ARBs. And you're probably very familiar with this because our first go-to treatment for blood pressure anyway, uh, but making sure you take those medications if you can tolerate them as well. And again, not just for the heart, but large fluid removal is bad overall. Um, so it leads to worsening symptoms on dialysis, cramps, fatigue, and headache. Um, if I move too, fluid, too much fluid too quickly and I don't give time for it to shift, so I take fluid from the blood vessel, but a lot of your fluid can build up in the tissue around, so I have to give time for that fluid to come back in. So if I aggressively remove fluid from the blood vessel, I can drop your blood pressure, and that can lead to strokes, heart attacks, ischemia, and other organs because they're not getting good blood flow. We, we've looked at, looking back on retrospective studies, if I have to remove more than 13 mils per kilo per hour on dialysis, I increase your rate of mortality. So aggressive fluid removal is not good overall. So fluid restriction is very important with dialysis. Um, and that's why hemo can be difficult because you're in center because you're stuck. You have a more restrictive fluid. So bone disease. Um, calcium and phosphorus are stored in your bones. Kidney's job is to help regulate these um, elements and keep them in balance. So we follow, as you get blood work every month on dialysis, we follow your calcium, your phosphorus, and your parathyroid hormones. And then essentially, we'll talk about some bone disease um, as we go through this. Um, but phosphorus is a big one um, that we follow with dialysis. When your kidneys fail, its job is to get rid of phosphorus. Phosphorus is hard to remove with dialysis, especially in center. It takes a long time on dialysis to really get phosphorus down. We try to keep it less than 5.5. If your phosphorus is high, it leads to itching, skin sores, can worsen heart disease, and a rare complication called calciphylaxis. And if you develop calciphylaxis, it does 
have a very poor prognosis. The problem with phosphorus is it's not on nutrition labels. So it's really hard to follow it in your diet because it's not listed there like your sodium is and your potassium is. It's a preservative. It's in a ton of stuff. And like I've had problems with phosphorus when patients just switch brands of crackers because it changes their preservative. Um, so it, it, it's a really kind of frustrating marker that we have to always follow and adjust for. It leads to a, a higher pill burden because we have to take phosphorus binders to bind phosphorus in the gut instead of absorb it. And so, but we do try to control this. The other level I talked about was parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone controls the calcium and phosphorus levels in the blood. So when your calcium is low or your phosphorus is high, your parathyroid hormone goes up. What does that do? It tells the bone to break down and puts calcium into the blood because your calcium is low. So if your parathyroid hormone gets too high because your phosphorus is high, it's telling your bones to break down. Or if it's too low, your bones get no turnover and they get brittle. So if your parathyroid hormone gets too high, you can develop something called osteocytis fibrosis cystica. And this is high burn turnover. It's also called a brown tumor. Um, it does increase your risk of fracture. And as you can see here on the x-ray, the bright bone here, and this is what's happened to these bones up here. And that one has a fracture. Um, so overall, not good bone health. And then if we said, OK, let's get it down low. Well, then your bones don't turn over at all, and they just become fragile and brittle and called something called adynamic bone disease. And this also leads to increased risk of fracture. Um, so the treatment for this, so we talked about controlling your phosphorus, vitamin D helps, Senecalcet helps, and if it gets so bad, we, can we may have to remove parathyroid glands to help control the phosphorus. Um, so for anemia, I'm doing fine. anemia is one of those complications in blood work that we follow regularly. Um, it's, uh, what it is is low amount of red blood cells. Red blood cells have hemoglobin in them. Hemoglobin carries oxygen from the lung to the rest of the body. So the kidney is involved because the kidney's job is to make what we call epopoietin, which tells the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Um, so you become anemic when your kidneys don't work because it's not making EPO. Um, and you also need iron to build hemoglobin. And your gut doesn't absorb iron as well when you have kidney disease or you're in chronic inflammation. Your iron doesn't get put where it's supposed to be to build the hemoglobin. So you're kind of at a two-problem two deficit. You have no building blocks to make hemoglobin, and you have no one telling the bone marrow to make the hemoglobin. So our treatment for this is we follow labs. We give IV iron with dialysis. Our goal hemoglobin is 10 to 11. Um, and we don't push you to normal, because if we use um, ESAs or erythropoietin stimulating agents, which we can give you on dialysis, if I push you to normal, we increase your risk of stroke. We have found with quality of life and symptoms with fatigue and anemia, 10 to 11 seems to be the sweet spot to not increase our risk of stroke, but still give us benefit from feeling better from having enough oxygen, oxygen circulating. So dialysis-related amyloidosis is a rare a uh, long-term complication of dialysis. Essentially, what that means is proteins build up in places they shouldn't be because they're not getting removed. The main protein is beta-2 microglobulin. Um, it's removed by healthy kidneys, but not really well on dialysis. It's like phosphorus. It takes a lot of time on dialysis to get that removed well. We don't usually see this until about five years of dialysis. It builds up in joints, bones. Um, you get carpal tunnel from it. You can get heart problems, inflamed colon, or like an enlarged tongue from this. And then essentially prevention is, is not letting it build up and get deposited there because we really can't get it out. So, you know, they, longer dialysis um, can help with some of that removal. The treatment is mostly symptomatic. We treat the joint pain. Um, we, if it's carpal tunnel, we can release it. Um, and kidney transplant to help start to remove some of that. The other rare complication is nerve damage. Um, it usually affects the peripheral nerves. 60 to 100% of dialysis patients may have this, depending on what study you look at. It appears to be from toxins build up from damage on the nerves. Also, if you have diabetes, you're likely to get peripheral neuropathy as well. Uh, we just don't know what toxins. The symptoms are pain. You get pins and needles sensation, like that your, your foot's asleep, burning or stabbing or shooting pain, or you can develop weakness. Um, ways that we try to prevent this is making sure you get enough of your B vitamins or your water soluble vitamins because those can be removed with dialysis. So thiamine, B2, B6, B12. If you get a renal vite or a renal vitamin that comes with dialysis or over the counter, take that as instructed because that will help prevent some of this. Okay. And then pain control as well with nerve pain to help with that depending. So 
I just went through a lot of bad stuff that happens on dialysis, and you guys are like, why would I do this? But there are ways to live a good and long and healthy life with it. And you'll notice some of the, the things I talked about with diet and fluid and, unfortunately, you know, kind of the same old thing you hear every day, right? Diet and exercise. But I think it, it does, this is even more important here to help you develop less complications from dialysis. So you want to ensure that you're getting adequate dialysis. You want to know that your blood is getting cleaned well enough. Um, and that you do it regularly, you're not missing, and you're going the whole time, okay? If you are, want to check and look and see, there is a lab that gets done every month at a dialysis unit called KT over V. This is our marker of good blood cleaning, okay? And it depends on what type of dialysis and what your goal is. But you want to make sure you're meeting that goal, okay? Um, and they're going to be working with you to get you there too, but having you know what you're talking about, looking at your blood work and being engaged is helpful with this as well. And remember, your kidneys are doing this 24-7. Dialysis is only a part of time, so you want to make sure you get as much clean as you can while you're there. So diet and nutrition. I'm sure a lot, you heard me talk a lot about fluid restriction, salt diet, phosphorus. Sometimes you need potassium. Um, and this all depends on what type of dialysis you do. Like I said, if you do home hemo or parrot meal at home, you're doing it more frequently. So you can have a more liberalized diet than those who do it in the center. Um, the thing with diet, to give really specific recommendations, is it has to be tailored to each patient and their blood work. And you get blood work twice a month at the dialysis unit. There's a dietitian in every dialysis unit. Use them. They will help you figure out what you're eating that's not right, figure out what you need to do, what's hidden somewhere that we're missing with salt that's causing some of these problems, making sure you get enough protein in there as well. Um, and again, some patients do have to limit some of their potassium foods, too. So it can get a, be a pretty restrictive diet um, if you're not careful. So the other thing I want to talk about is staying active. Unfortunately, with dialysis, a lot of barriers to being active. You feel tired after dialysis. Some people, because of you know, all the stuff going on, they're depressed. They're not sleeping well because dialysis seems to mess with some sleep. And so this gets into be a spiral where you don't do anything because you're too tired, you don't feel well. And then you get deconditioned. And then you can't do anything more because you get even more tired because you haven't been doing anything for so long. It turns into this spiral. And so, you know, I think some of the things I tell my patients, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be 10 minutes a day. Park further back in the parking lot and then walk in, you know, like take the stairs somewhere. It's, it's very simple stuff to add to start to work up to being active. I'm not asking, and you could do it multiple times during the day. You don't have to give an hour a day of exercise, you know. But I think this could all help is that. Um, some people get uh, under the desk pedal thing, and when they're doing home hemo, they'll pedal at home to help with exercise even while you're on dialysis. Um, but exercise overall helps you sleep better. It gives you better energy. It's good for your heart. Um, so depression and mental health. About 25% of patients on dialysis have depression symptoms. Not, I mean, you have a lot going on. You're sick. You're on dialysis. It doesn't surprise me that people struggle with this. Um, I think getting the mental health that you need to help can help you overcome sleep. We know that depression is associated with increased adverse events. You have more ER visits. You don't sleep as well. You have a decrease in quality of life. Um, honestly, it can get in the way of even just following your dialysis script because you get kind of apathetic about things. So I think making sure we stay on top of it and acknowledging and getting the mental health services, either cognitive behavioral therapy, medications, certain things that we can do to help you out um, with that. So... I think in conclusion, some of the biggest things to help you live a long and healthy life on dialysis is make sure you choose the right dialysis for you. You know, if you're miserable in center, then that's not going to work. Or if you're too much home dialysis, requiring too much care on other people, you need to go in center. That's, you gotta, and you got to move back and forth as your life changes. Um, it's life changing again. It's not life ending. People do great things with that while on dialysis. I think you need to be engaged in your care. Pay attention to your blood work. Pay attention to what you need for diet, making sure you're meeting the, the goals of the blood levels that you need to be. Know what's going on and how it's going on. Um, again, there are complications of dialysis. I think, you know, diet, exercise, um, adequate dialysis can prevent some of these complications. So making sure you do a good job while on dialysis. Um, so here's my contact information. You guys can email me anything. Um, and at that point, I will take any questions.